Moving on, while the ADL released its report on anti-Semitism in the United States, the Tel Aviv uh, University Cantor Center for the Study of Contemporary European Jew Jewry released its own audit of anti-Semitic incidents worldwide. And unlike the ADL's report, Cantor found a 13% increase in anti-Semitic violence, harassment, and hate. And what's worse is that the numbers don't even come close to telling the whole story. The numbers of violence uh, do not give the full picture because numbers of violence do not show that violence itself has become more brutal. Take the case in Pittsburgh with the 11, take the hyper with four casualties, etc. Each of them is one case, but cases have become more brutal. But despite the rise in attacks and brutality, overall immigration or aliyah to Israel has remained somewhat constant. Well, here to break down the numbers further and analyze the data is Ziv Maor, the chairman of Israeli Media Watch. And via Skype, we also have Dr. Ilana Heidemann, the executive director of the Israel Forever Foundation and an expert on Holocaust studies and anti-Semitism. Thank you both very much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you for having us. It's, it's absolutely my pleasure. All right, so first of all, uh, Ziv, I'll start with you. You know, why do you believe Aliyah has not increased uh, despite these numbers? Well, because eventually, what is Aliyah? We tend to look at it as a phenomenon, as something big, and often ignore the very facts and the very motives that get people to make Aliyah. It is difficult for someone who lives in a prosperous country such as the United States and such as many of the European countries to take all of his well-being, all of his lives, and move to Israel. And while it is, uh, to some extent, inconvenient uh, and even traumatizing to live in the current climate of anti-Semitism that is indeed rising, uh, the price of taking your whole life, disconnecting yourself from whatever you used to, and coming to Israel is a very high price. Now, we are aware of what is going there, and, but I completely understand the fact that the state of Israel, the population of Israel, is at the end of the day assembled from people who by making Aliyah, they improved their level of lives. Currently, making Aliyah from places of prosperity, from prosperous, uh, places around the world, means that people will have to jeopardize their, their livelihood and their well-being in order to come here. And I completely understand this climate, why people would not do that, and why even though we have a rise in anti-Semitism, they still do not do so. All right, Dr. Heidemann, first of all, uh, same question. You know, why do you think that the level uh, of Aliyah has not really increased? And second of all, do you think that it should increase or should not, and why? I think that the Aliyah is not the answer for everybody as a response to the rising hate. I think that first and foremost, people are concerned with finding a viable response to cope not only emotionally but also psychologically with the uh, effects of the rising hate on themselves, their families, their communities, especially their children. How is it affecting their sense of self? We live in a world of uh, increasing identity politics, so for somebody who lives in the diaspora to make the leap to uh, say, I'm now going to use the use Aliyah as my response to this hatred, it almost seems disjointed from maybe how their life was led or their personal ideology relating to Aliyah beforehand. So that there what is already very prominent, which is these issues of identity politics, who am I first, a member of the society in which I live or a member of the Jewish people and therefore aligned with the project that is Israel and my birthright as what we at Israel forever call a virtual citizen of Israel. Um, you know, they, they then have to also say, well, what will the compromise in my life be? And I think that uh, it was already highlighted some of the logistical and technical elements that are challenges, but I think there's also a psychological dilemma of am I going to run? And is that actually a step away from fighting anti-Semitism by trying to take refuge in the Jewish state where they will face a whole other spectrum of issues that they weren't used to in the culture from which they come? Okay. Uh, yeah. Th there is one point that is worth mentioning and focusing on about what we just said. That is, who am I? Who am I first? Am I first a Jewish or a member of the society that I'm a part of? Now, not so long ago in France, it came to a point where immigration uh, among many of the immigrants who brought themselves the anti-Semitism that caused the terror attacks over there, it came to a point where Jews over there felt that their society is pushing them away. 
And this is what caused the immigration wave and Aliyah wave from France about three to four years ago, uh, a part of which about 100,000 French citizens, Jewish citizens, came to Israel and made Aliyah. Now, despite what we currently see in the United States, this is not the same. Not only uh, uh, surveys keep stating that Judaism is very popular among the, the general population in the United States, the United States hates anti-Semitism, despites it, pushes it against, and the Jews feel they are being backed by the general population as part of the American society, uh, a feeling that I can understand that many of the French Jews just a few years back did not feel. This is why I believe that we, sh we shall not expect, at least in the current level, which is in the rise of anti-Semitism in the US, uh, uh, to see great waves of Aliyah. All right, now... I'd like to... Yeah, please. I'd like to be able to, cap to, to jump in on that as well, because I think that asking people to make Aliyah as the answer also jeopardizes for themselves the family relationships that they have, their professional lives. And so we have to think bigger in terms of why someone would make Aliyah. We know throughout history there is Aliyah by choice and, of course, Aliyah uh, by need, those who had to come here because they were escaping one or another form of persecution. I would have to say that over the last decades, we see a lot of disdain looking at those people who are coming here by force. Why don't they come to go to other places? Um, but I think more importantly, a dilemma facing the decision to make Aliyah is the very disjointed personal connection that many Jews have with Israel. They feel conflicted because they may not understand our culture, they don't understand the politics, even though they, they may think they do, and therefore their relationship is based on a critical analysis of Israel and her political and military behavior. Now, I was However, hit. we have not been success successfully fostering a connection to Israel aside of those political or ideological allegiances. And that's actually what we at Israel Forever really aim to do, because Aliyah does not come from nowhere. You have to give people, just like love for Israel doesn't come from nowhere, you have to give people a reason. And today, a lot of people are lacking an understanding of why is this for me? And if escape from anti-Semitism is the only reason, it's not reason enough. Sure. All right. Well, so let's so let's go back to the Cantor study for just a moment. Uh, being an expert in anti-Semitism and Holocaust studies, uh, Dr. Heidemann, you know, what do you think the biggest driving force behind the rise of 13 percent worldwide, uh, you know, especially in Europe? What do you think the driving force behind that is? Uh, and do you think, you know, perhaps the anti-Semitism may have always been there under the surface and it's maybe just more public now uh, and it's been allowed to become more public? Or is it building? Is it actually building? Uh, today where it wasn't before? I absolutely believe that it has been bubbling under the surface in every generation and there are time and time again upheavals in society that empower the people to voice what they might be feeling and might even know that they are feeling because they need someone to blame. They need a finger where they can point and say, it isn't about me, it is not my own failings. It is actually someone I can say they are responsible for either the problems in the world, the problems in my life, the event that took place. Don't forget that when the shooting happened in Pittsburgh, there was an immediate reaction that even by the Jewish community in America, that Israel was somehow to blame for the shooting in Pittsburgh, okay? So we see so many versions of this Jew hatred and its expressions that it's, it's not possible that it's only new. It has so many elements of traditional anti-Semitism, historical trends that are repeating themselves, but if you eliminate the word Israel and replace it with Jew, only then do we see the parallels of the same phrases and ideas that had been shared throughout history. So most definitely it is something that is emerging again and again and never truly disappears. So, so uh, when I had studied extensively with Professor Robert, Robert Wistrich, known as one of the world experts on anti-Semitism, one of the things that he emphasized again and again was, here is the world's longest hatred and it does not disappear. It only gets hidden under the ideas of becoming a cultured, 
assimilated into the societies where Jews live. So we need to be very, very aware that this yeah. is not new, but it is just a new upheaval of repeated events in history. If we study those events in history, perhaps we can actually come up with a smarter way of responding that doesn't only focus on pick up your whole life and move and run, which again is what diaspora Jews hear when they say Aliyah is the only answer. Okay, uh, final comments, you know. Well, there is an elephant on the room, which is Islamic anti-Semitism. Now, I, without undermining even the little bit, the tragedy in Pittsburgh, I do well, believe Well, and the that ADL also found that most of it was white supremacists. Uh, Isla uh, Islamic well, extremism uh, certainly did account the, for some the of the ADL, attacks, but the that wasn't the majority of it. The ADL did account for some anti-Semitic anti remarks on its own. Jonathan Greenland made one on January 2018. This is a harsh statement. I made it in this studio before. The, anti the ADL is a problematic organization with, which has... Let, let's put it aside. Let's talk about... Islamic anti-Semitism, okay. uh, once again, final I'd like comments, a final sorry, comment, I cut, uh, cut without undermining the tragedy in Pittsburgh, the, the, most, the deadliest anti-Semitic uh, anti attack in the U.S. was 9-11. Islamic terrorism is the current form. Well, can and the you current really accurately form. call that an anti-Semitic yes, attack? Yes, that's exactly the point. Because it's a, it, it, the anti Islamic radicalism is attack against Jewish and Christian Jewish values. This is what it is. It's not a matter of whether I say it or not. Now, the fact that we always focus on political right as the source for anti-Semitism is a mistake because you earlier asked about the 13% rise of anti-Semitism in Europe. It does not come from the fringes of the political right. It's come from the, from, from, from the enormous amount of Muslims that come there and bring anti-Semitism with them. Anti-Semitism is embedded in the culture, in the language of the Arab and Muslim world, which, which is something that we should encounter. And this is the right lesson from the Holocaust. All right, well, unfortunately, we have to wrap it up here. I, I know that we could talk about this for forever. Dr. Heidemann, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and Ziv Ma'ol, thank you as well. Thank you.